and welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And I'm Meg Hopdahl. And this week we're talking about The Lost Boys. Meg, have you seen this movie before? You know, I it's one of those movies that I know I saw when I was younger. It just didn't like leave a profound effect on me, I, which I know... Um, isn't probably not a popular opinion because um, I know a lot of people it, it really it really mattered to them in their childhood and I there were scenes that were familiar to me and like but it's kind of one of those where it's like I did see it but I, I definitely a lot of it was new to me too so I'm gonna get right into it the history of it it came out in 1987 and so to put it in perspective like you were too young to see it when it came out but I was around the ripe age like right when it came out on VHS probably when I like saw it at a slumber party and it was like taboo to be watching it it has a 74% on Rotten Tomatoes it had an 8.5 million dollar budget and it brought in 32.2 million dollars now just to also put it in perspective this movie was kind of a big deal when it came out like people were f- freaking out and like vampires were a thing all of a sudden it was the lost boys and also it's kind of epic because this is the first movie that the Corys were in together I didn't know that about the Corys. that's that is pretty cool so was it sort of like when Twilight came out that kind of like big cultural thing Kelly's nodding her head. (laughs) It felt like this vampire resurgence. Now, Joel Schumacher, who was the director, he wanted to make this movie with these older, sexier kind of vampires and, like, have them be, you know, older, like, high school, college age. Um, And he is actually... This movie is actually credited with making vampires young and cool again because up until this point, vampires were portrayed as, like you know, Dark Shadows and, like, Older and Bella Lugosi and and sort of those classics. And so, you know, that's not necessarily young and hip. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely... I'm I'm laughing thinking about it because this movie was so 80s and, like, and it's, like, I know at the time they seemed so cool. (laughs) But, like, when I think about them, it's just, like, oh, boy. But But I know, I know at the time it was, like, wow, young, hip vampires, awesome. And yeah, it seems like a novelty now. It's like, I mean, it was a novelty then. It doesn't seem like a novelty now. It's like, of course, vampires are young and sexy. Like, that's all we see. Speaking of which, we're at the Vampire Diaries convention. And it's like, those are young, sexy vampires. Yes, I would say sexier than, I don't, I don't like Kiefer Sutherland, Kelly. I'm just putting it out there. I don't like him. And I have no good reason. Like, there's nothing he's done. <laughs> but I just don't like him. He hasn't personally affronted you. Yeah, I just, I feel, but I feel like when I see him, I feel personally offended. But, like, there's nothing, I have nothing to point to. It's just, you know how there's some actors where, you're like, you just don't like their face. Wow. This is, okay, this is breaking news on Horror Rewind. Din, 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 din. Because I did not know that. Okay, I probably saw this movie, I mean, I don't know the year, because we still need to watch Flatliners. I saw Kiefer Sutherland in this probably first, and then I saw Flatliners. Eh, maybe that, yeah, probably. That was the the progression. And I don't hate him, but I never was. I've never been attracted to Kiefer Sutherland. No, I mean, you know, I do like that movie, The Vanishing. And he's in that movie. And he's fine in that. But I just don't like him, Kelly. This is this is big. This is big news. Okay. If you didn't know, the Lost Boys title is a reference to Peter Pan. Like vampires, the Lost Boys in Peter Pan never grow old. It was originally meant to be a younger cast like the Goonies. Hence, Corey Haim and Corey Feldman. Um, you know, th- like that sort of age. But... They ended up casting them as older. What do you think about that? I don't know. Like, I feel like if it, if, are you saying that the vampires were supposed to be younger? Oh, okay. Yeah. I think actually I would have liked that. I understand. And I think it would became the phenomenon. It was because they were teenagers and it really spoke to a certain sort of subset of teenagers. But I feel like if it was like sort of Stranger Things vibe, I maybe would have liked it better. Or Goonies, like you said, I would have liked it better. Um... Yeah, so spoiler alert, I didn't really love this movie. And I know, I it's like the craft where I like know that it's so close to people's hearts. And I feel like I'm like 
being mean, but I'm just sharing my opinion, and I didn't love this movie. I didn't hate it either, but um, anyway, yeah, I mean, I feel like I feel like Corey Haim, though, and Corey Feldman were the best part of the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, no, they were great. So that's why, in retrospect, maybe it would have been good to stick with that younger cast. So this is something I wonder if you knew. They say that the city is Santa Clara, but it's actually Santa Cruz, California. And it was the actual serial killer murder capital of the world in the 70s. Did you know about this? No, I didn't know that um, that it was the serial killer capital. But that's interesting because I, I, that was cute when like the grandpa's like, yeah, that's that's where you're moving to. I mean, and then their reaction was very different than mine would have been, which is yay. <laughs> so yes, there there's a billboard that touts this city being the the murder murder capital of the world and apparently santa cruz was that in the 70s so that's based on fact which i thought was kind of interesting um this movie is credited with inspiring buffy um joss whedon saw this movie and was like oh what if there was a teenage girl though that had to go out and slay the vampires so you know inspired buffy and also Anne rice said that she wrote her vampire novels because of this movie well that's interesting i i could see that i mean i don't know a ton about Anne rice i've tried reading a little bit of hers and i've saw, seen movies and stuff but um i could see i mean like you were saying you know it's funny how we don't realize like the beginning of these sort of cultural things and yeah to me it's like of course vampires have always been like in a young and hot and everything but I mean even if you if you think back to like Salem's Lot for example the movie and the book they're not hot they're not so I can see how this sort of was the advent of that and um, that's kind of cool I love that there's a video store in this movie and I love that there's a comic book shop and these younger characters I mean they're really the heart of this story I think they are getting their information from these comic books and they know how to defeat the vampires because of their knowledge from these comic books. Yeah, I love that. That um, There's this sort of idea that their superpower is their knowledge of comic books and, and that that's a great thing. And like I said, that's I loved Corey Feldman in this movie. Um, he just brought a bunch of levity to it. And like, the, what is it about Corey Haim? He's just so um, lovable and... Um, relatable and he's sort of an everyman sort of kid yeah I always loved him as we noted during Silver Bullet okay a couple things from the beginning and then I'm going to get to what I didn't like so the beginning the credit sequence they play people are strange and they're showing people around this town they looked fairly normal to me because like the things that they that were supposedly out there quote unquote were like tattoos and piercings and colored hair which like I see that every day. Yeah, I thought, and that was something I actually kind of liked about this movie. I thought they did a good job of setting up um, the sort of setting. And it's like, I'm, you know, I'm not from California or that area. I've been there. But I felt like they did a really good job of, like, setting up, like, what this city is like, what the culture is like there with the comic book shop and the video shop, too. But there was this sort of, they're trying to show that it's, it's a little different than your Midwestern town, which I thought was kind of cool. The, the One of the first nights that they're in town, they go down to the boardwalk by the beach and there's this live music playing and like the saxophone guy who's like all oiled up. Apparently, people love this and it's like a thing. Um, he really toured with Tina Turner. He's like a real saxophone player, but like, holy crap. It was so extra. Like it was so, I laughed out loud because it was so extreme. And like it's supposedly like super cool and sexy or something. Here we go. Are you ready? This movie needs more women. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciated Diane Weist as the mom. That was her, right? Yeah. I appreciated her. Um, she was, she was kind of a fun character, but yeah. And I mean, I guess Jamie Gertz, but like she had all the charisma of like a cardboard cutout. Sorry. I just, I, I just didn't feel it. So the only I mean, yeah, those are the only two women. And Diane Weiss is so gentle and she's so lovable and she's so um, lovable as 
the mother in Edward Scissorhands. She was the mother, right? Yeah, yeah. And I've loved her. She's a great character actress. And she's just, yeah, she's so maternal in this that you just, you feel the, like, comfort vibes. And I love that she just wants to go on a date. <laughs> she's just trying, like, boys. And she's, like, she immediately runs to, like, save them when Corey Haim calls and is like, oh, my God, he's trying to kill me or whatever. And she's just like, okay, cut the crap. Like, I'm trying to go on this date. Which, you know, the guy ends up being a vampire. It's kind of like Fright Night. Yeah, there were things in it that reminded me of Fright Night. Um, I have to say, if I had to choose between the two, I definitely like Fright Night better. Um, and I, But I did really like the twist about Ed Herman being um, the, the head vampire. Because when, Ke- and I know I'm skipping ahead, but when Kiefer Sutherland... Um, it dies it's kind of like wait what and then the whole sort of twist though he's not really the head vampire and I thought that was really cool I I really like that there are a couple things that I did appreciate also there's this POV vampire cam like every time we see them fly we never actually see them flying we just see people reacting to them flying and it's actually just the camera so I think that was good because it might have been kind of cheesy to see if they were flying if they were bats or something yeah, I think this was a good lesson and sometimes to leave things, you know, yeah, you, we don't need to see it all if you can't get the right CGI. The other thing that was that I appreciated is when they f- push that vampire into the bathtub full of holy water and garlic. He's like, garlic doesn't work, but it was holy water. That was pretty gross because like all this gross stuff came out of all the drains and having holy water in the water guns like that's super clever. And and I feel like that must have been one of the first times that was done. And it was just kitschy. Yeah, I like that a lot. And I also I really like the scene when um, the they're all trying to see if Ed Herman's a vampire and they're like trying all these things and they like they're like want more Parmesan and it's like, gar- you know, it's a ton of garlic. And so I really I, th- I thought that was really cool and they they had a sense of humor and that is one thing about this movie like I think that's why I didn't like Kiefer Sutherland in particular in this movie is that the movie itself doesn't take itself too seriously but I felt like he did yeah actually and Jason Patrick like people were having like creaming their jeans can I say that (laughs) over Jason Patrick but have you ever felt Jason Patrick speed too no i i i don't know i i feel nothing for him i mean he's he has a nice face i guess i don't know yeah i know i know i feel the same way um the grandpa is a funny character because he's clueless he does taxidermy the running joke is that he keeps leaving these taxidermy animals next to Corey Haim's bed and he wakes up and like puts him in this closet that was pretty funny yeah I like that and there there were those elements but I think yeah I think I like figured it out that my problem is is that the movie itself doesn't take itself too seriously but it's like then there's this sort of like I don't know this element of like Kiefer Sutherland like and and his his ragtag group they just think they're so cool (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was reading that, like, a thing is Kiefer Sutherland or all the characters in the movie say Michael, which is Jason Patrick's character name, 118 times. So every time Kiefer Sutherland, like, addressed him, he's like, Michael, Michael, what do you think of this, Michael? It was just, like, over the top. It's a little lazy writing. And, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. So what did you think of this kid character um, who was with the the woman like that was the lone vampire child what do you think i think vampire children are interesting um that's explored really well in um near dark that movie there's a child a vampire child in that um i thought it was interesting and it, it ga- i guess it gave um jamie gertz's character something to do because otherwise she really didn't have anything other to do other than have sex with jason patrick so I mean, it gave her, like, we got to see a, sort of an aspect of her, I guess, through that. But I don't know. I think it was, it was, it's always interesting. I think kid creatures or kid vampires or kid zombies are always creepy. And I think of Dawn of the Dead. The scene that was uh, a bonus on the director's cut, when you rewatched it, those kids coming out and Ken Frey has to kill them. It's just like, it feels wrong. It's like, you know how in um, GTA, the video game, like they don't put kids so that you can't run them over with your car? It's kind of like when kids are in these worlds, it really brings it to a whole other level. And sometimes it's like, whoa, you know, it kind of like blows your mind because you don't, we don't want to think about it that way. Like even Walking Dead, I think, started out with a kid zombie right away, which is kind of cool. So, 
yeah, it, it sort of takes everything to a whole new level. Yeah, it raises the stakes in a nice way. Uh, so this grandpa, he appears clueless and he's funny, but at the end, he knew it all along. And, you know, he reveals like, oh, the thing about this town is the vampires, like whatever. So it's it's kind of funny. So that brings me back to the things that I loved about it or liked about it were those funny things where it was like self-aware, yet you're right, all of the vampires were so serious. And the guy from Bill and Ted is in it. Like, we know he can do comedy. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it was that those two things just didn't mix well for me. And I'm, and I know this is something that you and I go back and forth on, and we have differing opinions. I don't like bad boys. Um, I like I like a certain type of bad boy, but I mean, at the end of the day, like I love Dep- I want to have sex with Deputy Dewey from Scream. So like, I like dorky, nice, positive guys, and like, <clears throat> there was there's an absolutely zero sex appeal to me to a guy who like takes himself too seriously. And I know that's not the point. <laughs> I know it's a horror movie, but it just like it just there's no that there's just no charisma or no interest there for me. Yeah, I I agree. And I do like bad boys, but my bad boy thing is more like Jughead from Bad Boy. He's really a nice guy. He's not really a bad boy. So, you know, it maybe I don't really like bad boys. I don't know. We need to rank this movie and we need to pick something from the movie to rank it on. Um Worm Chow mein. Yeah, that's great. Like when he's using his mind to change the Chinese food for Jason Patrick. So out of zero to ten worm chow mein containers, zero being you hated it, ten being it's a perfect movie, how many did you give The Lost Boys? I am giving it a six because it to me it just fell a little flat and I felt like the hype was just not there for me and it Some movies really stand the test of time, and I felt like this movie is just, it didn't really transcend the 80s, and there are just not really good female characters in it that we got to really follow and watch character development. So, speaking of that, I don't think there were any people of color either. There were no women or people of color. Um, I appreciate this movie for how it inspired these other creators, because I love Buffy, and I did... Like I won't say I loved, but I liked Interview with a Vampire when it came out. Like, that was a big deal to me. But I'm going to give it a six also, and I feel like a six is generous. Because um, it didn't live up to what it was at the time. But, you know, I appreciate that it inspired the other things I love. And and this is often what I, like, dock points for. I was just bored sometimes. Like, to me, if you can't keep my interest, like, you don't, you, it has to be a six, sorry. Yeah, I agree. Hi, horror friends. Lisa here. And today I'd like to make a drink with you, inspired by the Lost Boys. I'm calling Spilt Milk. For this drink, you will need tequila, almond milk, as almonds are a staple of the great state of California, and all of those missing children on all of those milk cartons left an impression. Thanks, movie. (laughs) Some... Arizona iced tea with lemon, as our family were following, made the journey from Arizona, felt appropriate, and some Star of Annis, as if it weren't for Star, Sam and Michael wouldn't have gotten into any of this mess. All right, you'll also need some ice and a lowball glass. Let's get started. Fill your lowball glass with ice, pour in an ounce and a half of tequila, an ounce and a half of the lemon iced tea, and a half ounce of the almond milk, which is going to give a really cool look to it. You'll want to give it a stir before you drink it, but it looks great after the pour. And then we're just going to go ahead and garnish our glass with that star of anise. And cheers! We've got a nice easy one this week to sit back, have a few laughs, have a few jumps, and enjoy the lost, boys. Cheers, horror friends. It's time for our fast forward segment. Meg, what do you want to talk to us about this week? Okay, so I want to talk about Westworld, which I know everyone's heard of. It's not like I'm uncovering some hidden gem or anything, but um, I love it so much. 
And what were you going to say? I can tell you what to talk. I was like, I was going to interrupt you and say that it's, you know, like them uncovering the maze. But anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it feels like forever ago since the first season. So I was really glad that they did a um, recap for when they started the second season um, the other day. And I don't know. How did you feel? I felt like I wished I had watched the first season again. Yeah, we were a little bit lost. And this is why I love binge watching shows after a couple seasons are already out because it's like week to week stuff and then having to wait a year in between seasons. I forget a lot. I'm old. Tell us what you like or love about Westworld. Well, I think there's lots of sort of fun conceptual things that come out of this whole idea. I mean, the whole idea itself is amazing. And from that sprouts all these interactions between robot and man and you know what makes us human and all these sort of interesting questions rolled up into this world that I'm obsessed with like this idea that you could create this west world and what I'm hoping for and it looked like maybe a little bit when they said like coming up this season is I really want to see other worlds because we've seen west world but I know that they've mentioned that other worlds exist I think it's fascinating too and how interesting to have that opportunity I mean it kind of reminds me of Ready Player One where everyone's sort of living in this virtual reality instead of the real world I mean it's not so much so in this this is more like a vacation but wow there was a really great scene last week and I know you haven't seen that episode yet but it was just like putting in putting it in perspective when Westworld began like within that their timeline of what it actually meant and also have you seen the original movie with Yul Brenner? No I never have. It's on Amazon um, to rent. I think we rented it like right after season one ended and it's kind of fun to go back and watch that because you can see where it is inspired from and it's not so bad. Well it's good to know. So I I think what's kind of funny is the the whole show is really a warning you know of, of it's it's sort of this idea of even in Ready Player One, there's a warning of, of getting too deep, immersing yourself in a fake world and not living in reality. Yet I j- find myself just like picturing what worlds I'd want to live in. I know. Like going back to Ready Player One, when they go to the Shining Hotel and like get to actually be in there and like try to solve the mystery and stuff like holy crap wouldn't that be amazing yeah I mean yeah that scene was amazing um yeah so it's like I don't know for me I would love like a I don't know pre-Victorian England Jane Austen type world how about you yes and so this is the part where we go back to what we were talking about before Uh, we romanticize a lot of different time eras and a lot of different places but as long as there's indoor plumbing like I don't want to actually go and experience that so yeah I would love to go experience Jane Austen world but then I can go and like watch tv at night (laughs) (laughs) yeah agreed agreed um yeah I mean I think this show, it, it relies heavily on the concept, but the concept's so good. And of course, obviously, it, it's executed excellently, and there's wonderful acting and really rich characters. And it's also, like, I love the music in the show, and it's just um, beautifully shot. And so it's just a treat. I, I really love it. Now, somebody that Mark really likes and admires uh, tweeted or said on their podcast that uh, Westworld's a terrible show and anybody who likes it is just lying and they and nobody gets it and if you like it you're just lying and pretending to be smart and I to that sir say you're an idiot <laughs> <laughs> well and anytime anybody attacks like saying if you like this show you're an idiot or something I mean that's that's kind of a broad paintbrush people are using so I don't know but um, yeah I mean I don't think it's that complicated Hated. <laughs> That's why I'm calling him an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, there there are shows that are much more mind fuck. Like, I I just I don't think it's that complicated. But okay, but yeah, no, I um I just think it's really good, and I really love the sci-fi element of it, and um I'm excited to see what happens. It's got some timeline 
things I mean I guess wait spoiler alert last season did too but this season we really are being mindful of like oh this is this timeline this is this timeline and even if you're in one person's timeline there might be multiple times or places that they're showing us when they existed and so it might be a little more complicated to follow but it's worth it yeah so if you guys get the chance um check it out and I mean it'd be it wouldn't it be fun if you hadn't watched it and you had all the episodes to watch right now so do that thanks for your fast forward Meg and we hope that you can send us some recommendations for great TV shows that we can binge or new ones that are airing that we haven't checked out yet. Until next time, we'll see you in the horror section. Bye.